Um, thank you guys so much for coming uh, tonight. Um, very, very excited to continue Alleria, keep it going. We couldn't do it if you guys didn't come. And great, great, awesome people that are here keep coming back and very fortunate. Um, I want to just make a couple of announcements real quick before we uh, bring our speaker on for tonight. Um, membership. So there are a lot of new people here tonight, and I'm very thankful that you came. Um, if you sign up tonight, which I know some of you have, if you sign up to be a member tonight, um, you can actually get for you can get it for forty nine dollars for the entire year instead of ninety nine. So definitely do that if that's something that you're, that you're interested in. Um, we um, are you. So is anyone listening to the podcast at all? Anybody? A few people. Awesome. I think it's I think it's pretty good. I'm I'm a little biased. <laughs> we got some um, really good investors, not only here locally, but some really good investors throughout the nation that have experience here in Birmingham um, that have been on the podcast, that are coming on the podcast. So definitely download that, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever, wherever you get your podcast, just search Alleria and you'll be able to find that. Um, and then the Daily Ria show, anybody watching that? Anybody on our Facebook page, our YouTube page watching the Daily Ria few? It's not daily anymore. It's not daily as in every single day. It's about three times a week right now. It's hard. It's hard. I'm trying to I'm trying to hold down, I'm trying to do some other stuff. It's, it's, it's hard to keep it every day. But anyway. And if you're interested, if you are an active investor and you're interested in me following you around for four or five hours and, and kind of kind of really video logging what you're doing, um, I would love to do it. And I think I think it's really important. And that's really the reason why I'm even here. It's the reason why you guys are here. It's important to, to get Birmingham um, Birmingham stuff out there. That you can go anywhere. You can go on YouTube. You can go anywhere else and find stuff about real estate investing. You can, there's every single thing you could possibly ever want on YouTube. But how much, is it, it, how much of that is local to Birmingham? Like hardly any. So I think that's, that's really important if you're here, if you're here in Birmingham. Um, and I also want, the last thing I want to say before we um, bring up a couple people um, is just April 13th, Matthew Gregory is going to be um, speaking. We're actually going to be talking together. It's just going to kind of be a conversation. <coughs> bring your questions, okay? Make sure you bring your questions. We're going to get um, any question that you may have about um, fixing and flipping houses. Make sure you get those answered by the guru. And then in May, very fortunate, Mr. Walter Baker is going to be speaking to us about private money. Um, about how to get private money um, here locally. So I think that's really good. And then in June, so far we've only got till June booked out. Um, in June, my very good friend, Mr. Claude Diamond, who is a sales and marketing expert guru guy, did a podcast episode with him. It's actually, I think it's going to be released uh, in a couple weeks. He's going to be right here in Birmingham. He's from Colorado. Awesome, awesome sales guy. Um, he, he, his whole thing is sales is the missing link to your real estate business. Because you got to sell yourself, and you got to sell your low offer, and you got to make sure it gets, it gets accepted. So how do we do that, and how do we do that in three to five minutes as well? So it's really cool. For, for a minute, I want to bring up uh, Mr. Jay Baxter. I'm going to bring up Jay. Um, Jay's going to just talk to us just for just a few minutes about his experience um, with Aaron. Aaron Chapman's our speaker tonight, and he's going to be teaching us, you know, or talking to us about um, well, a lot of stuff about bank money, a lot of things, and I want and Jay actually, who's right here in Birmingham, did a deal with him. So I want kind of Jay to just kind of give his experience. Where's Aaron? Right here. Ah, oh, good to meet you in person, man. Really appreciate all the work you did for me. I, I really appreciate it. It's been great. Um, so you know, I am not an experienced investor. That's not why they asked me to speak today. I think Brian mainly wanted me to speak just to tell my story and how I got started. Only been doing this about a year, and I uh, was very excited about this meeting until I found out I had to speak. You kind of ruined it for me, Brian, but still having a good time. Uh, so I, I studied for years. I read every book, I read all Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I read, you know, Keller's Millionaire Investor, and got on bigger pockets, probably all the same things that a lot of you did when you were getting started. Uh, had analysis by paralysis. And when I finally had a breakthrough and, and started buying properties when, was when I first started coming to meetings like these. That really changed everything for me. At my very very first meeting, I met Brian and uh, sat down and we talked for about an hour and a half. And in that time, I probably learned more in, than all the books combined just because he knew the local market. He knew all kinds of strategies for 
uh, finding properties, acquiring properties, how to rehab them, how to get them tenanted quickly. And, uh, you know, people like him, mentors like him, and other people that I've met since I started in this business have really finally kicked me uh, in, in the butt and said, you need to you need to grow up here and actually start doing some deals. You can't just study forever. You actually need to buy some properties. So I've got uh, five now, and I've got two more under contract. And when I was first getting started, when I was first talking to Brian and other people, I, I was just all over the board. I wanted to do flips, I wanted to do tax liens, I wanted to do everything. And, and he and several other people that I trust and that were just helping me get started said, look, you know, you're, you're not going to be an expert at anything for a long time. You need to pick one thing and get decent at it. It's going to take you years to get great at it. So just narrow it down, pick one thing, and try to, you know, cut your teeth there, get good at that. And I picked single family residences. Uh, the strategy that I chose was a Burr strategy, and that's something I learned on Bigger Pockets and had a lot of local real estate investors kind of help me do. So all that means is you buy, you rehab it, you rent it out, and then you refinance. Um, so Brian helped me found, find my first deal. Pretty fun story to tell because it went really well. You know, when you start out like that, if your first deal is a home run, I promise you will be addicted. You will be absolutely hooked in this business. He found me a little place in Hueytown. Love that cash cow. Thank you, Brian. And um, it, it already had a tenant. This was a, just the deal with training wheels. Bought that. Uh, then I approached Aaron after we had the deal done and said, look, I, I've got it. Uh, I've purchased it. Now I'm ready to refi it and see what I can get back. This is where uh, Aaron's expertise really kind of changed everything for me because I had very limited capital. <coughs> just like probably a lot of people in this room, it's not like we're made out of money. You, you know, blood, sweat, and tears work as hard as you can to save up a little nest day, and then we, my wife and I decided that uh, we would try real estate. Uh, we put some money into this property, and once I had it uh, financed, I wanted to get my money back out. He was able to pull, help me pull every single dollar back out, and that's been true on four of the five deals. He helped me get all my money back out uh, because I bought right, and that was because of training from people like Brian. Um, so a very simple criteria to get your money out. He can, he can help you. Get all your money back out of your deals if you do these simple things. First, you've got to find a property that you can buy and rehab for less than 75%. The beauty of real estate for me is that it, it is not a perfect market. It's not efficient like the stock and bond markets. You can find amazing deals out there. Um, you know, if somebody inherits a home, they don't live here. They just want to unload it. They don't want to, you know, try to rent it out or anything, and they don't want to rehab it. Uh, lots of foreclosures, that happens all the time. If uh, you know, somebody loses a job, unfortunately that means the bank takes it and they'll you know, give it away in a short sale for a pretty good price a lot of times. So you can get that, put some money into it as long as after uh, you've got it prepared, you can pull out 75%. Um, if you're in it for less than that, you're gonna get all your cash back. And I was able to do that four out of five times and that just means I'm recycling my capital into the next deal. And um, that's, that's pretty much that's pretty much all I've done. I've done that five times, and I'm about to do it two more because it's working so far, and he just helps keep me pull money out. Uh, the, the final thing I'll tell you before I turn it over to Aaron is you'll never, you'll never be successful in this business unless you form a lot of relationships. I, I still feel like I'm really a beginner. Don't know a whole lot, but I've got a great banker. I've got a great wholesaler and realtor, great rehab team, uh, and an amazing property manager. And you need those relationships, otherwise it's very difficult to be successful. This is much more a relationship business than it is a uh, transactional business. So keep going to stuff like this, meet as many people as you can, and you'll be successful. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I probably flew through that. I'll tell you three criteria that are really important to me. Let's say I buy a house for... Um, I buy a house that I know, just because I know the market really well and I talk to people that I trust, that it's going to appraise for $100,000, right? That's the appraisement. Immediately, I know I cannot, between my purchase price and all of my rehab, spend more than $75,000. That is my cap, because Aaron's only going to be able to help me, because this is the Fannie Mae guidelines. It's not his decision, it's, it's Fannie Mae. We'll only allow you to pull 75% out. So I can't go over that. That's just one really important criteria. The other th two things I'm looking for is uh, rent to value ratio of 1.5% minimum. Take the monthly rent that you know you can get out of that property, divide it by your purchase price. You know, it's easy to get 1.5 in the local market. If you can get two, you feel like a hero. That's second criteria. Third one is for me, minimum $150 cash flow. 
Uh, we're in one of the best cash flow markets in the country, so that has been the easiest criteria to meet the other two of the tough ones. But uh, anyway, thank you very much, everybody. I'll turn it over to Aaron. And I just want to do, I just want to introduce Aaron to you guys. Um, Aaron's become a, a friend to me actually over the phone. I've spent many, many hours with him on just on the phone trying to help other people um, like Jay get connected. And, and so we met through a mutual friend and, and Aaron's out in Arizona and he came all the way to Birmingham um, as a personal favor to me to, to speak to you guys and, and talk to you guys about bank money. Probably he's got some stories to tell as well. I want you to stand up on your feet, guys. I really do. And give Aaron a great Birmingham welcome. Aaron Chapman. So usually the stand doesn't come before I speak, so this, this is a uh, unique opportunity for me. Jay, not only did he give us a great intro, give us a breakdown on how we did business together, but he showed up to look like the banker. <laughs> so I am the unconventional conventional lender, basically. Thank you. Um, so as everybody had eloquently put it, I'm Aaron Chapman. There's my disclaimer. I start with a disclaimer because I can't be held accountable for anything I say. And so just know that. Just, I know it's being recorded, but I, I did disclaim right up front. So what I always what I want to start with is so people know what I'm not. Right? Because everybody likes to tell everybody what they're good at and what they can do and all these kind of things. So I'd rather start with what I am not, which is definitely not the lowest priced person out there. You can go online, get on the internet, you can find the cheapest money available. Now the thing about it is they advertise extremely cheap money, but does the cheap money actually make it to your pocket? That's the big question. I remember back when I was doing Reefwise and I first got in the business in 1997. Um, everybody just quiddling on us about rate, quiddling on us like crazy about how cheap it was elsewhere. Like, there's a guy down the street selling roses on a corner and tells you he'll give you a loan for 1%, but when you go to closing, you'll just get a rose. It's the reality of things, right? I am definitely not the fastest. We do the best that we can to get these deals done as quickly as possible, but there's all kinds of circumstances involved. I said, I'm setting the stage. Okay. Set the expectation low, deliver as fast as possible. Again, I got a phenomenal team. I say we're not the fastest, but these girls deliver all the time. On time, fairly predictable, unless there's situations we're not aware of. But this one I can definitely say is true. I'm definitely not the sexiest. <laughs> but if the world is going completely to hell, what the heck? All right, here we go. So we already got the uh, technical issues. I'm not good with these things. At least you guys get to see this one again. So ultimately, if the world's going to hell, you're going to want this bald, bearded, some bitch in black with you. Period. And the reason I say that is because I dig in and we work our guts out for the people that we're working with. So what I am, though, is it here or here? Where is this thing? Okay. So I am the banker, as I've indicated, and I'm about ready to pitch this thing. So, well, let me get into this. You guys know I'm a banker. That was my family. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what happens when you stack these things on top of each other. And so what I, I got to thinking it would be <laughs> the right thing here rather than just fight this thing. Exactly where is the reset re, the, re, the thing we're using it here? I'm going to stand over by this thing. Okay, so everybody knows I'm a real estate banker. We do we do, we do mortgage loans. This is part of my team. This is the logo. I've been working in this business since 1997. Got out of the mines in New Mexico, stumbled into this particular environment. And from there, uh, we've been working our way through the market, all these different things that have come about. And I finally found myself working with real estate investors in 2003. 2003, they started coming into the Phoenix area from California buying up real estate because of the appreciation was ridiculous at that point. So I was renting limousines, my mom was a real estate agent, and we were moving product like crazy all through Phoenix. Then what happened in the mid-2000s? Everybody knows what happened at that point, right? Well, not only did that occur, the market crashed the way that it did. I was ripping down the freeway to get a four-day break. It was August 8th of 2008. Eight's my lucky number. 
1224 in the afternoon, I'm on a road king, ripping down the freeway, a guy turns on his winger and comes right into my lane. I hit the throttle to get away from my couldn't get away from the, the other car. So at 80 plus miles an hour, I'm flipping. Woke up that night, midnight that night, first memory coming into my head, what was going on. Asked my wife for like the 30th time, where am I, what happened? Was in a wheelchair for about six months, and then I came back to a business that was obliterated. But you have to reinvent yourself. You have to start figuring out different ways to go about things. Stepped back into the industry in late 2009, started finding investors coming back into Phoenix. Got hooked into the right group, and then started working with investors across the country. My next uh, real estate license that I got was in Indiana. And then it over into Tennessee, Texas, and Alabama. I've been working in Alabama since about 2011. So next, I'm a husband and father. I've been married 21 years as of February 17th. And that 21 years has been hard as hell on her. Um, but I've got a 19-year-old son, 17-year-old daughter down low there. She works for me now. She's the one that keeps me on track, follows me, makes sure that my calendar is taken care of. Another 16, then my youngest, my 10-year-old, she's still like a chimp on cocaine. <laughs> I mean, it, we have yet to discuss having children, but yet, here they are. And they're, and they're, they're, great. they're great. They're an absolute blast. I hang out with them more than I ever did my entire life. I'm also in charge of the technical rescue unit for the Sheriff's Department in Phoenix. It's actually the Pinal County Sheriff's Office. They cover a big uh, uh, mountain area called the Superstition Mountains. Um, do a lot of technical rescue in the sense of high angle stuff. People get hung up on cliffs. We go down and get them. Used to be I was the guy that would go down and get them. Now I'm in charge of it, so I now have to direct it. I don't get to have the fun anymore. So I train everybody and um, and run all the operations. I also formed and started their opera rescue unit. Really cool stuff. People roll their jeeps out in the middle of nowhere. We've got to go out there with jacks and cut them out of it. And I'm in charge of the air rescue unit. So a lot of a lot of extracurricular. I get to do that with my wife. She's uh, the only woman on our air rescue unit. The only one that's in reality badass enough to do this kind of stuff. Um, she's a paramedic, and I'm also a gearhead. There's my daughter taking a selfie with me in the background working on one of the jeeps. So at this point, I wanted to get more into a discussion about really what it is I do and why is that I'm here. I said I'm from Arizona. Why am I all the way over in Alabama? I just left Tampa, Florida this morning at 4 a.m. Make it up here. I was speaking in Tampa to a bunch of uh, real estate, um, a lot of turnkey guys, a lot of uh, flippers, a lot of wholesalers. There was about a hundred of them there, and we were we were working for three days on building our businesses up. And what I'm finding is an opportunity to really bless people's lives differently than I'd seen in any other way in the in the industry that I'm in. It's one thing to be able to get somebody a, a loan on their house. But let's talk about that for a second. You know, a lender who's doing a loan on somebody's house, I, I mean, it, it's a necessity, right? But when that's your sole client, there's really no, it's hard to relate. Because for, for you, there's a different reason why you're in your house for, as to why somebody else over here is in their house, right? The individual I'm talking with, maybe, you know, they need that house because it's on the perfect street with the perfect kitchen. Down the street from his wife's yoga studio, and she'll be happy, so when they get the house, everything will be perfect. And when I ask for a piece of doc documentation, I am stopping them from getting their dream. That's me blocking them from what they deserve because they're citizens, right? So it's a whole emotional process, very difficult to have that discussion with somebody because you don't know, you can't quantify it. It's hard to put the nuts and bolts to it, but when you talk about real estate investors, it makes more sense to me. That's the language I speak. So how many in here have real estate right now, rentals right now? I'm here trying to get rentals right now. Most everybody, right? Um, that's, that's what I do. There's a lot of different types of money out there, but I try, but my goal is to assist you in getting that accomplished. And how I do that is we find out what is it you're trying to accomplish, what is the goal you're trying to set. And we change the mindset from consuming. You're not spending money and going into debt anymore. Right? That's what people are thinking when they're buying real estate. You're spending a lot of money. Right? And instead, you're actually just taking money from your liquid account, putting it to a non-liquid account, growing it at a certain percentage per year, and you're not taking on debt. It's not debt anymore. You're taking on a business partner. If I was gonna go into business with you, and I put up, let's say it's $100,000 to buy the business, I put up $50,000 and you put up 50,000, how much ownership in that business do you have? 50%. See, and anybody can answer the question. 
How much decision-making power do you have? What, you, what, what percentage of the decision-making power do you have? 50%. What percentage of the profits do you get to keep? 50%. When things don't go wrong, I do 100% of the bitching, right? Or if things don't go right. I'm the one that's just completely complaining because that's how partnerships work, right? They get half of all the good stuff, but they do 100% of the complaining when it doesn't go perfect. Now let's talk about your real estate investment firm you're creating. So that's what we're going to create. Real estate investment firm. You're not me to take on a partner. I'm going to bring you to a partner. I'm not going to find it. And this partner will put up 80% of the capital in your business. But what percentage is that, that, that partner going to take from you? Take zero. You put up 20% of the capital, they're going to put up 80. But you keep all of the ownership of that business. All they want is right at this point, depending upon where rates are at any given time, about 5 to 5 and 8% of that 8% in 12 installments every, every year, and they leave you alone. You're free to run your business the way you see fit. So what kind of a business model has that? If somebody came up to you and said, hey, I got this really awesome business, I need you to put up 8% of the capital for it, well, I'll give you 5 and 8% of that 8% in 12 installments, and you have to leave me alone. No, it's it is a, it's a really poor, really poor sales pitch to try and raise capital for your business. But yet we have an opportunity out there that people are scared to, to jump into because we have been ingrained to believe that it's dead. It's not. When you think of it in the right perspective, you're actually taking advantage of their of their business model to enhance your business model. So we'll go into a little bit deeper deeper talk about that. And I'm gonna ask more questions. If I come to Bug Jimmy over here, do some calculations for me. We're going to talk about you now as the CEOs of your real estate investment firm. And as you know, was being brought up over here by Jay, that we've got C Chief Operations Officer sitting right back here. Ryan, wave your hand. Your Chief Operations Officer is already in place. He's already trained. He's already got an operations division put in place for you. You don't have to hunt him out. You don't have to interview him. You don't have to go through any process. It's already done. How's, how's your chief operations officer working out for you? Fantastic. I'm right now applying for the CFO position. Again, been in the business since 1997. Been working with real estate investors since 2003. Been focusing on just that for thousands of transactions. I've seen where people have done it right. I've seen where they've done it wrong. I've had to go in and undo things. There's been several clients that made just little tiny mistakes because the people they were working with were not looking at the big picture not thinking about the long-term goal. What is it you're trying to accomplish? They're just thinking transactionally. Transactionally is very, very risky. In a transactional relationship, they'll say, well, it's easiest if I get the loan done if I put both of you on it and push it through. Because in, in the banking world, in the services world, everybody's thinking really two things that makes it a good transaction. Getting it done fast and getting it done cheap, right? That's what everybody thinks. If you do that, then you're Amazon and everybody's happy. But when you do it fast and cheap, in the situation of thinking, hey, if I just put husband and wife on that transaction, because they both make great money, and I'll be able to get that deal done quickly, and they'll think I'm awesome because it, I didn't have to think hard. It didn't take much to get them qualified. And underwriting just blasted it through because they didn't have to think. But what they do is they set you up and cost you a potential property down the road. And I had some people who had to undo some of those transactions that cost them tens of thousands of dollars. Now they've made it back quickly because we were strategically planning our future to get that all back. So that's where, when I say I'm applying for the CFO position, is because when we talk, we're going to talk about your business and where you're taking it from right here to over there and how we're going to get there. And what are the potential risks based upon your situation? We're going to look at what's going on within your, your current financial profile and how do we structure that to accomplish what you need to. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this. This isn't a sales pitch at all. This is just the reality of what I do. And if this doesn't fit your mold, then that's, that's good. That's, then, we, then we at least know we're not a good fit. But if we are, it's important to explore it further. So as a CFO, I'm going to ask certain questions. I'm going to bug Jimmy here, because um, he was um, gracious enough to put his name in my, uh, my database today, so we can start working together on one of his transactions. Um, if you're buying a $100,000 piece of real estate and putting 20% down, how much money is that? Everybody agree? 20,000? Well, let's say the, the costs to get this done, and we're talking about the taxes, the insurance, the title expenses, the uh, in inspections, the appraisal, the lender fees, and anything else that you got to throw into this thing is going to be about $5,000 at close. How much money are you spending? 
He said 25,000. Anybody disagree with that? Everybody says 25,000? Spending five. Anybody disagree with that? We got two different thought processes. We got spending five or spending 25. I'm gonna have to call one of them right and that's five. And the reason being is because the $20,000 is not spent. Is it still your money? The money moved from your liquid account to a non-liquid account basically tied into a real estate, it's still there. You can still get it, it's just very hard. Right, let's think about it like a MetLife insurance policy. You know, you got a whole life insurance, you put 20,000 into your MetLife policy. Many people put it down in their application, they got 20 grand in here. How accessible is it? But yet you still believe there's 20 grand there, because we've taught that. Or you're being taught now that you still have $20,000 sitting in that account. You're just not touching it. You've held it, you've gotten it away from you, so you can't go to Amazon and spend 20 grand on something you don't need is to fill up the closet that you should have other things in, right? Now, the $5,000, we're gonna address that here in a moment. Now, let's talk about that 20 grand. How does that grow? You're gonna rent that place out, you're gonna put somebody in it, and then they, and what I've seen across the country, I'm talking about a national average here, if you're buying a $100,000 piece of real estate, you're gonna, I've seen people making 250 or more per month in cash flow after all expenses. So that 250 bucks a month, is going to come in and take care of that. The um, you know you're going to be able to cover the the cost of the loan. You're going to be able to cost the taxes, the insurance, your property management. And still net that 250. That's what I'm seeing as an average. But that person's also doing something else. They're knocking down that loan. You're not paying it. They're paying it. And as they're paying it down, your balance is going from twenty thousand to a hundred thousand over a thirty year window. So you divide that by 360 months, and you take that figure, and you divide that by the 20,000 that you initially put into that account, that's 13.33% per year on the average. It doesn't start that way initially, but on the average over the 30 years is what that's growing by. You're making 13.33% over a 30 year window before tax benefits, before appreciation, and before rent raises, right? Who would argue with 13.33% return on their investment? Very few people. Now let's talk about something else. You spent five grand, right? That five grand though is getting repaid back to you with the 250 a month that's coming to you in the form of cash flow. I'm gonna bug Jimmy again. How long is it gonna take? Actually, I'm gonna bug everybody. Jimmy's getting put on the spot. First answer gets, actually nothing in there pretty much. Um, I will figure something out though. Um, so, What's that? 20 months. He didn't even know the, he even know the question. <laughs> He's got the answer. 20 months. <laughs> so, yeah. But see, I didn't, I didn't offer the price yet. So, 20 months, he gets his five grand back. In 20 months, you're now playing with the house's money. So, what happens from that, the remaining 340 months? How much is that? You didn't know I was going to ask that question, did you? You're going to make $84,000. So let me check my math, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I've been up since 4 a.m. traveling from Tampa. They had to change a tire on the plane while we're sitting on the tarmac in, uh, in Charlotte this morning. It's been an interesting trip. But um, so 340 months go by, you now make another $84,000. That's 164 grand. And how much did it cost you? Five grand. And how long did it take you to get it back? So did it really cost you anything? No, that's $164,000 when you didn't really spend a dime. Because your 20 grand is still sitting there, so you now have 184. You started with 20, you have 184, right? So some people will come back and argue with me a little bit, because they have to. That's human nature, and I agree with them. You know, you gotta test, but, you know, trust but verify, right? So what about vacancies? What about uh, maintenance? What about those things? I've asked that question of many of the, the uh, turnkey providers that about this, I've asked many people who've been managing properties for 20, 30 years. You know, there's a lot of guys who've been doing this for a long period of time in certain in certain markets. 30 years may be a little bit aggressive because I know there's some that are over 20. I said, would it be reasonable for me to say that if you've got a well rehab house that's a that's a decent rental, that your maintenance costs and your your um, vacancies? <coughs> thank you. Uh, your vacancies um, could be maintained over that 30 year window with $40,000? That's a reasonable, it's like, dude, that's, a, they're like, that's way too high. 
I, I said, I get that it's high, but is it reasonable? If I throw that figure out there, somebody would come back to me with something that's going to be a lot higher. And they said, no, but they, they're thinking 40 is extremely safe. So let's back that 40 off your 164. What do you still have? $124,000, again, before tax benefits, before rent increases, and before appreciation. So you're going to look at other metrics that you're going to measure these properties by. You're going to look at cash on cash return. You're going to look at cap rates. You're going to look at the rent evaluations. All great metrics, but, but unfortunately, I believe that they miss those, those factors. When you start breaking it down to its simplest level, you're, you're playing with somebody else's money to make a small fortune here. And then you get to go back to the government and say, I paid all this interest. You, need to, you owe me a couple bucks. I mean, it's an extremely huge win-win. And what the reason that I need to illustrate this, because if you're going to go out there and look for a CFO in the form of a banker, you need to know whether or not they understand what you're trying to accomplish. And that's what we're trying to accomplish together. You're getting ready, some of you, to trudge down this particular path, what may be the first time, maybe the second time. Sometimes the second time is still scary. You know, I, I deal with rescue. There's a lot of times we're going out after people as their first or second time on a the trail, they get lost, they get off trail a little bit, and they're hurt. They need help getting out. They came in at too timid to begin with, right? Little unprepared, got themselves hurt, we had to get them out. You guys are getting ready to go down a path or on a path right now. I'm telling you, you can have your rescuers with you. Myself and Brian will be right there with you through the entire process. After a handful of those transactions, then we're just running up and down the trail. Because the first couple of them are always tough. I tell everybody, get ready for the most miserable experience of your life. Now, it's really not that. But I want to at least paint the ugly picture. Because you're giving up a lot of personal data. You have a lot of personal information to try and get something out of it. And when you're doing that, you've got to know that it's going somewhere where you can trust. And then you're going to be asked for more data. And then more data. And more data. And then eventually it just closes. Right? And then during the process, it's miserable. But instead of like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I'm making money now. So trust in the system. Trust in who you're working with. It's all a matter of building the right systems in place with the right people. Again, you're the CEO. You're the one who makes the decisions. I just give suggestions. You don't have to do it, darn. Just because you start a process and sign a loan application doesn't mean you start, you're stuck. You can still move around. In fact, we have you signed a disclosure, and uh, Jay signed it several times. It's called a voluntary information disclosure. It has this way of making it seem like you don't have to give us anything when we still have to do our job. Of course, it's a government disclosure that says you have, you, anything you do is voluntary. We can't make you do a darn thing. You have to move at the pace that you feel comfortable with. So then at that point, right, so we start that process, we start figuring out how we're going to get you on the path, then we can domino this into a very big way. I was talking with Jimmy just beforehand, we're sitting in the library, about some of the different directions he's considering going. We talked about a, uh, a strategy that we've seen people start to employ quite a bit right now. Who knows how many, li how many loans Fannie Mae limits you to? Ten. Ten finance properties. You know what you're, how much you have to put down for those ten? Twenty percent, exactly. Which is interesting. Most people still believe that it's twenty percent for the first four <laughs> and twenty-five for the next six. There's a lot of banks that still require you to do that. I have my license with a firm that allows me to do twenty percent down on all ten. And we can do all 10 in the same house. Most places, they don't let us do that. You know, most places I was at, they would limit us to four or six. So I parked myself with a firm that believes and understands the real estate investor. So with those 10, let's say you get those 10, what next? All right, you're all CEOs, what's next? 10 more on the spouse. What's that? 10 more on the spouse. 10, well, we can definitely do 10 more on the spouse's name. True. But if you don't have the spouse and you're a sole CEO, you don't have the co-CEO and you got 10, you have to come up with a strategy. So the thing that Jimmy and I were talking about earlier was you take those 10, if we're talking about $100,000 properties here, or the average, uh, let's, let's back that up to like the average cash flow being $200, $250 a month, how much is that on 10? $2,500, bucks, right? And what area are you starting out in here? You're in Birmingham. Is it reasonable to believe you'll have a $50,000 loan in there somewhere? Yeah. Very reasonable, right? So if we're getting $2,500 a month, this is where I'm going to really need somebody else's math because uh, I'm starting to, everything's starting to slow down up here. Um, if you're making $2,500 a month on all your properties and you're taking that cash flow after you put enough cushion aside, maybe $5,000 sitting somewhere, 
you take that cash flow and you tack that fifty thousand dollar balance, how long is it going to take to pay off? About two years. About two years. Now what do you have? Now what's coming in? You paid that property off. What's its cash flow now? What's the cash flow going to be on yours again? It was like six hundred and thirteen dollars or something like that. So you got sixteen six hundred and thirteen dollars coming in on that property, right? But now you have an open slot. You just paid one off. You can have 10 finance properties. We can go buy another one. Push 20% down and get another one. Now you got 10 finance properties, one paid off. That one fine, that additional finance property is still giving you 250 bucks. So now you still have the 2,500 coming in on your 10, but now you have another 600. Right? So now you have $3,100 coming in. The next house you have has, like I said, $55,000 balance. You attack that with 3,100 a month. So you have to run that number for me. 17 months, you're paying that one off. Now that one's paid off making you 600, so you got 1,200, you bought another one, you keep it 10, 10 finance, you get now 2,500 plus your 1,200. Where are we sitting at? 3,700. 3, you're attacking the next house at a $70,000 balance. You see where it's going? I ran that calculation a very, very long time with a, with a client of mine, uh, a CEO, let's put it that way, of mine, and we were, we we're punching these numbers with his portfolio, the exact portfolio he had. Um, trying to run this up, and by the time you reach the sixth house, he's paying off one every nine months. The velocity of money is ridiculous. The thing of it is, you just have to get on the path. We just have to take the step. And it doesn't matter if you're ready now or you have everything in place now. You need to be talking with with people that can tell you what to what to do now to get prepared to get started down that path. Was that at that adage? I don't know if it's Confucius or who said it, but the journey of a thousand miles kind of starts with a single step. If that single step is a phone call to Brian, or that single step, step is a phone call to me, or a single step is an email to Jay say, hey, what, what made you get going? Whatever it is, it's the step. Our whole job is to help you stay motivated into what you're doing and help you see the benefits to yourself and to your family. I've, I've been able to see in the industry, the time that I've been doing this, how things have evolved in my business to the sense that it has become bigger than itself um, in the sense, it, be, it became that when I started doing it for the right reason. Before I was trying to feed the family. And then I reached that point in the country wide when things were just going crazy in 2003, 4, and 5. That it's because now I'm a big shot making a ridiculous amount of money. You know, and um, had 12 cars at the house, and I had actually had like 12 houses, and I owned it. It was, it was ridiculous. It was, it was stupid what was going on there, and I was in it for the wrong, had the wrong reason, and then things came crashing down. And then you get a second chance, and you get in for a correct reason. You start looking at things for the right for the right path, and that's one of the things that you really need to get firm with. Whether well, you're getting, getting ready to buy this real estate and build this business, why are you doing it? There's a lot of power in the why. And what I found that drove things beyond anything has been when I started making it about somebody else. And started finding that I started seeing I have these staff members that are putting their blood and guts into these things. Who, who was working with you on those, tra those transactions? Uh, I'm in my office. Oh, Carla. Carla. Yeah. Let me tell you about Carla. A lot of you guys are going to get a chance to, to, to talk to Carla if uh, you have the opportunity to work with us or we have the opportunity to work with you in this minute where it's correct. Um, there's this, there was this little pub down the street from our house that we go there now and again. And uh, she remembers the second time we walked in. And she was serving there bartending. And she remembered our names, remembered what we liked, the whole works. And then after about probably six, eight weeks, I walked in and she wasn't even there. I go, where's Carla? I mean, the other people were cool, but it's not Carla, right? As we're sitting there, I had one of those type of doorways that was kind of hidden around the little wall. When you walk into it, I saw the light kind of come into the room. Somebody was walking in. Every glass in the place raised, and they yelled, Carla. And she comes in, and she goes over to where we were at, starts talking to us. I'm like, that's really cool. She goes, I hate it when you do that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I say, this is not the first time. You can't teach that. You can't train that. Well, a week later, she gives me her resume. She goes, hey, I just got my degree. You know, anybody's hiring. Well, I heard a mentor tell me one time, if you find good talent, you hire them, regardless of whether you have a job for them or not. I said, yes, I am. I really wasn't. 
but I knew that I could find a spot for her. And how would you say she is? She is amazing. She, I mean, she remembers me after that first transaction was months before the second, and she still remembers me and asks questions about my family and things like that. She's amazing. She probably even knows what you like to drink. <laughs> probably. And she is. She's absolutely the best hire I've ever had, and I've had some great hires. And so my why became Carla. It became Ellen. It became Erin. It became not me, Erin. I had an employee named Erin. It became Christina, Nicole, Andrea. It became all these girls. Brandy, Kim. I went from having a couple of employees a few years ago, we have 10. And they all have kids. Some of them are single moms. I'm their economy. I know you're somebody else's economy. When it became about that, things really, really grew in a big, fast way for us. And it became of that because we started understanding that we were your economy. We didn't perform. You did not reach the goal you were looking for. And then, you, then we have situations like with, with Jay. His scenario, there's, there's many of the clients that come into us and they've got that piece of property. They got a phenomenal deal on it. They pay cash on it. Um, but they need to get that cash out to want to deploy it. They want to keep it working. They can't work their plan without it. You know, I'm lucky and I'm blessed enough to work with an institution that understands that there is this program available we can put to work and that we can use that to the benefit of our, of our investors, pull out that cash. And if you're wise enough and you go about your business the right way, you're linking with somebody who's, your, who's doing your operations division properly, many times you get all that cash back out. Now, it is, you know, based on what's going on in the market, if you get all that cash back out, you've now got, I mean, we already established you get these properties for free, right? How much more for free is it when you really get it for free? I mean, it's ridiculous free. I, I don't know how to explain that. You know, the only thing that's holding you back is you at that point because the opportunities are sitting out there. We can pull that cash deploy it again into another one, then you pull that out and deploy it into another one. You're never, you're never even leaving your money on deposit at that point. It was already a ridiculous deal, and now you're not leaving your money on deposit. And in, in worst case scenario, I think, Jay, you had one, you probably left $4,000 on deposit. Well, that was because I screwed up and overpaid. I violated my own criteria because I got greedy. But yeah, one out of the five, I didn't get all my money back. The other four, I but did you get greedy? Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I don't know if you did. If you overpaid, how did you get greedy on that one? I'm kind of lost on that one. But I think is um, sometimes opportunity is there, and you have to sacrifice a little bit. Because you are still doing better than probably 90% of the people out there that are not thinking that way. There are still a lot of investors out there that are not attacking it the way that Jake attacks it. And they're still doing awesome because we just really illustrated that. We just illustrate how phenomenal these people could are doing putting 20% into it and not even touching it. Buying it that way. So there's, is, there, is there really anything that you can think of? What do we need to address that's the next fear that we need to overcome? I'm not seeing any hands. Because it isn't any. It's just a matter of having the right team on hand. Nobody goes climbing Everest by themselves. And I know in some cases this will be a little bit of personal Everest. Brian and I have been up and down it like crazy. We've got Jay that will also give you some coaching. There's a one for me to hand your oxygen to base camp too. To get you up that Everest because ultimately <coughs> Your success means that we are having some success. And I can't begin to explain how grateful we are that that comes about. And what I want to touch on real quick here is something that I learned. Who remembers The, the Secret? Anybody read, who read that book? Who saw the movie? I, I did the audiobook thing. I was running a marathon in 2005. And I think it was five hours long, the, the audiobook thing. So I just plugged it into my iPod and run this thing. There's a little bit left over. And I don't remember hearing all of it because when you're in pain that long, there's only so much you can hear, right? You know, four point some odd hours of pure pain. Um, but the thing I noticed about that, I saw the movie several times, I read the book, I listened to it. The one thing I didn't, I did not get out of it was the practical application of it. How do you apply it? How do you put it to work? Right? Um, then, about a year and a half ago, I had an employee young, very talented, very good, millennial. It was time for her review at six months. We sat her down, and I was going to talk to her about her where her pay was going. 
I was going to talk to her with her about where her performance was and how we appreciate her performance. And I did some looking before this to try and figure out what is what is the standard increase in pay for, for a wage, right? An, a, an hourly increase. What percentage would you guys say it is? Two and a half percent, that's what I found. Two and a half to three percent. She was getting a bonus too, so I was looking to bump her bonus up. She was doing a, the, the kind of job that I could justify doing more. So I made a case <coughs> with the senior management of the firm, and I wrote up this long narrative and brought out examples as to why I convinced them to allow me to do a 10% bump. I also, because I have discretion over bonus and her performance, I was able to give her a 30% bump in bonus. This was equal to $10,000 per year. I was excited to give her this. So think about this, put yourself in that position. It's time for this, for you to sit down with this person, this employee that you, that has been doing a phenomenal job for you. It's gotten you organized because she is the most anal retentive person I've ever met in my life and I am fly by the seat of my pants all the time. So my business is getting streamlined. I know where things are at at any given time. I would say, hey, I just send the name of the file and she'd say, it's here, 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 and here off the top of her head. She was just that good. Um, so I called her in, excited to give this to her, told her how much we appreciate her and all that she's doing, told her how much we were going to give her with a smile on my face. And she looked at me with a slight look of disdain. She goes, that's it. What's your gut reaction? Mine was to take that back and ask her to clean out her desk. That was my gut reaction. I, now, I, I pushed that down. I had to think, okay, this is, you know, I, I had to stop for a second and understand, what am I dealing with here? This doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and walk myself through that. And understand what um, what she may be thinking. And I understand that a person you don't ask, you don't get, right? I understand that principle. I understand that you need to need to always be looking for where you may be losing out on something. But at the same time, there's no gratitude. I want to just throw her out and her ungrateful self, and not and, and replace her. I was that angry about it, but I, I calmed it down, and she stayed aboard. But it was different from then on. That same week, I'm driving to work, and you put yourself in my same same shoes. You're behind the wheel of a lifted Chevy diesel freaking throwing uh, smoke down the freeway, right? And you exit the freeway, and there's a guy standing on the side of the overpass or on the uh, off-ramp with a sign. And you can tell how down on his luck he really is. You can tell this is not somebody that's going to make the money and run off and try and get another day. This is a person who truly needed help. Well, years ago when I was struggling, at one point I was dead broke. I pulled up to a gas station, did, my cards wouldn't work. I was on the other side of town looking for a job. I could not get back to where my wife was. I rifled through my truck and I found enough ones in the seat to be able to get enough gas to get home. So from then I kept cash in the truck. I reached that point where the cat, that place where the cash was, I just pulled out what was there, and I handed it out. He took the money from me, turned and walked away, and he's looking at me and he stops. He looks up at me, he goes, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. He goes, this is 20 bucks, man. He goes, yeah, I'm serious. So I still have my arm on the, uh, on the window of the, of the vehicle. He walks over to it, and it's lifted about here, where the, where the window is for him. He reaches up and took my hand with both hands. Bows his head. Says a prayer. out loud for me. And then when he was done, the tears running down his cheeks, he thanks me profusely for changing his day. How different is that? How do you feel about that person versus the other person that's asking you, really, that's it? I, was, I, uh, I wished I had more. If the guy had a square, I would have swiped my card. I would like to have given him the $10,000. But I didn't have it. I didn't have anything else with me. And then he hit me as I'm driving down the road. Said, That's the principle that I was trying to have to understand. It. That's how gratitude works. When you are ungrateful for great blessings, great blessings leave. Not only does that great blessing leave, but everything that brought with it.
can leave. When you are grateful for the slightest thing, the smallest benefit in your life, you get tons compounded on top of you. So I had to put that principle to work somehow. I heard a, uh, a mentor of mine say, you don't leave bed until, bed until you have three things you're grateful for, you stay there. But you don't stay there all day, you gotta get, get moving, right? So, trying to follow everything that he, that he, was, he was teaching me there. And I found that I have dozens of things to be grateful for in the fact that I have people like Brian sending me an email every day to Aaron meet Jay. Or Aaron meet Jimmy. Aaron's done a great job for us over the years. You may want to talk to him about financing. Immediately, there's a pad and paper right there on my desk or on my assistant's desk, which is my daughter Isabel. Both names get written down. Jay and Brian go on that. Jimmy and Brian go on that. And every other person. And at the end of that day, when I'm retiring for the night, I read those names out loud. Go to my knees and thank God for those things. When I wake up, I read those names out loud. Put it in my fist, kneel down and thank God for those names. People's lives are changing every day and I'm involved. My children have clothes, my children have shelter, my children have food because of you. A name on a piece of paper is one of the most powerful things that I have ever experienced. Calling upon deity in behalf of another is the ultimate that anybody can ever do for their fellow man. And so when people ask me, and I'm going to open this up for questions in a minute, but before I close, people ask me about why I'm doing what I'm doing. I get 9,000 minutes a month on this. I was at 300 and some odd emails. I cleaned it down to 300 emails this morning. There's over 900 in here now. And I have to remind myself that when you're exasper exasperated by interruptions, try to remember that their very frequency may indicate the value of your life. Only people who are full of help and strength are burdened by another person's needs. The interruptions which we chaff at are the credentials of our instant ind indispensability. The greatest condemnation that anyone can incur, and it's a danger to guard against, is to be so independent, so unhelpful, that no one interrupts us and we are left comfortably alone. I'm grateful you guys allowed me to take your time tonight. And I pray that it was worth your time to come here. And that when you leave here, you have that little bit more strength to be able to move into the, the scary parts of your business. I know the people are going to be here to assist you to get there. Thank you. I'll do a little Q&A. Cool. Let me bring Brian up here and we get some Q&A going about how to, how to do this CFO, CEO, Chief Operations Officer thing. You guys are good for that. The questions you guys have for Aaron. So the question was, if you're just new starting into it and you don't have any, you're not sure where you're going to get going, what do we do from there? Really, it's just a matter of gathering all the data I can from you, and then we start you down the path. Just because you can't execute on it, if you can't execute on a close to data, doesn't mean you can't execute on a close down the road, right? So the, the, the play here and the job that I have is to look at your scenario and give you thought process on how to adjust it. I can't make you do it. I can tell you things I've seen other people do. I can give you strategy. Your job is to execute a CEO. You know, you're going to be able to give me orders to do certain things at certain points. Just have to give orders to yourself. And then you have to follow through. <coughs> And then when you're at that point when things are rough, you're having a hard time saying, man, I'm having a difficult time with this, you call me. The phone number that was up there, in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and do something else here. Where's this thing at? I would like anybody who wants to, you can text your name to that number 
I'll send you my e-business card. You can calculate real estate calculations on this thing. You can contact me on it. You can shoot me texts. You can do whatever you email into, into this system. You run into anything like that, where you're in a situation where you're not sure where to go next, that's where you go. You get me on the phone. We schedule a time. Because when I schedule a time with you, I may not be able to grab it right then. As you know, there's 900 emails that came in today, or 600 that came in today. I'm going to be getting back to them over the next couple of days. But when it comes time that I'm going to, when, when we have the opportunity to talk, I will schedule that hour for you. I turn away from my three screens on my desk, shut them off, and we talk. We work out your, what we're trying to do for you. Fair enough? <coughs> do you put mortgages on low-income houses, or is there a minimum value? The lowest value that I've been able to get a loan done on was fifty-four thousand. When we we're doing the cash out, if we were doing a purchase on one. It was fifty thousand because they, they limit me on my loan to value. We got a seventy-five percent loan to value or an eighty or eighty percent loan to value, so it's eighty on a purchase, seventy-five on a cash out refinance, and really seventy-five on a refi period. Now, my rule that's the rule of as Jay brought up Fannie Mae. Now, let me ask this question. Does anybody know where the money actually comes from? Fannie Mae's money, where does it come from? <laughs> Taxpayer. Taxpayers. <laughs> that, that, that actually is a pretty good thought. It's pension funds. Anybody see the big short? Yes. Okay, who can tell me who the Real estate investor was in the big short. Apparently, you guys haven't seen it two or three times, right? I've seen it like three or four times. There's so much information in there. Take a guess. Who was the real estate investor? There's a lot of there was a lot of investor investment people. There was a lot of Wall Street people in there, but there was one real estate investor who traded in there. Donald Trump. Was he in it? It was the stripper. <laughs> the stripper had like eight houses, I think, right? Why did they put the real estate investor portrayed as the stripper? Because that's what they think of you as. <laughs> when you think about it, the people who are looking at this, that's what they're thinking is the people that are treating this, this real estate industry, that's why they have these crazy rules, right? And these things that we have to deal with because of how people use their real estate in the past. And the way she describes she's using the real estate is exactly how it was used at that time. So that's why we've had difficulty getting money and it's starting to ease up a little bit more. Now, when they do an audit on Aaron Chapman, they're probably just thinking, okay, if he's doing 600 transactions a year in 23 states, is he just flying around all the strip clubs in the Midwest? <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? Because they did, they just did a massive audit on us and found that we're, we're doing just fine. So the reason I bring that up is because that movie illustrates where the money comes from. Pensions, the biggest pension out there, I believe, is, Cal is CalPERS, which is a California employee's pension, uh, state employees. Those pension funds are being taken, that's these people's retirement money going to this large account and being used somewhere, right? They're either investing into the stock market, they're gonna go into bonds, they're gonna go into currencies, precious metals, commodities, somewhere to make money. They have that fund has to make enough money to keep them alive, pay bills, and give ridiculous CEO perks, and then pay a pension. So they have to keep it safe somehow, right? But then they got this presentation in 1978, say, hey, if you take that money and use it to fund mortgages, you know what your margin's gonna be, you can pay your pension, and you can keep the rest, and you don't have to have, have all these people on staff fair. We go to stocks today, we go to bonds, we go to precious metals, what are we doing? And you can keep this big up, but they're charging double digits back then, making ridiculous amounts of money. But as we know in the movie, they ran out of people to, to get loans. The criteria was not loose enough, so there was only a finite amount of people buying houses, so what did they do? They tried a social experiment. You want a house, you get one. And how'd it work out? So ultimately, this is somebody else's money. This is their retirement account funding your retirement. Your business partner is a retiree somewhere that wants only five and an eighth percent to fund their retirement. <coughs> and you get to make infinite off of that retirement. And I don't remember the point. <laughs> you were probably, I was asking if you would be a worth of money. Here, probably. Yes? Are you giving a 30 year fixed or what are you doing? So it's a $75,000 house, 
seventy five percent of that is fifty five or whatever. Yeah, about fifty five, fifty six thousand. Yeah, whatever. So then, are you giving thirty year fixed on that? Thirty year fixed at five point something. Percent. Uh, yeah, if you're talking about loan amount, the lower the loan amount goes, this is also part of the whole pension fund thing. The lower the amount, loan amount goes, the higher the interest rate goes. And a lot of people ask, why am I paying more for less? Right? Does that make sense? Okay, come on. I mean, I'm not borrowing that much. When that money comes out. And it goes to fund your transaction, they have to audit the process that they're coming out. And as it's working its way out, they're going to audit against state banking, federal banking, Dodd Frank, CFPB rules, the rules set forth by the uh, by the fund to protect that money. They're also going to audit it to uh, whether or not you have met uh, Securities and Exchange Commission laws and regulations. Then, when I'm done with the paperwork, <coughs> six inch mountain of stuff that's all about you, and it goes back to that do the same thing. Six different types of audits. The last time I was giving a figure on what that audit cost was, just the overhead on the audit cost was six thousand dollars. It's what they got to put out to have all these people do these audits, and these people are constantly on us. Well, you missed this little thing. No, there's this. There's that. I'm constantly getting emails about we, you know, we have a suspense on this one. I need to know this, or they're asking questions about something that never even happened. It's just they have fifteen dollar an hour monkeys sitting in a desk creating things for me to do, and. So that goes into the cost too, because I'm paying overhead on people to do this, right? There's no auditors in here, right? <laughs> you see the whispering on the back, and he didn't like the monkey comment. So I'm just messing with it. Uh, so we've got um, all this immense cost that's going on. That's not your expense. That's the fund's expense, right? The only way they get that money back is by charging you to return on the money they lent, which is the interest. If they lent out three hundred thousand dollars at three and a quarter percent, they get the money back in about seven and a half months, and then they make the money. If they lend you fifty-five thousand dollars, even at eight percent, you know how long it takes them to get paid back? Almost four years. They're in the hole on your business longer than you are, because you're never in the hole. But perceived, if some people perceive that they are for a little while, but your business partner. Is front loading six grand into your deal for you on top of giving you 8% of the capital. That is why the interest rate keeps going up the lower the loan amount gets. This is non recourse? This is recourse. Non recourse is typically done for like an I, like a self directed IRA. Um, there are some, um, you can't really get a non recourse loan very often in the commercial world. Because in the commercial world, you still even if you do it in the name of your S Corp or your LLC or your C Corp or whichever, you still have to do a personal guarantee. There's still a recourse of some sort. Um, but when you're talking about an IRA loan, or you're using your self directed IRA to uh, purchase a piece of real estate, they're only going to do it at 50%. You have your IRS put up the other 50, and they'll make it non recourse. It's only against the IRA, but they can't really go after the IRA, they can go after the asset because the IRA is protected by. Um, the laws have to do with uh, retirement accounts and all kinds of tax stuff. So that's why that that's why it's not recourse and those are protected. In this world, there is recourse. You are still liable for that debt. That's not really debt. So yes. what you're saying, they will do a non-recourse at 50%? Um, for your, if, you're, if you're doing a self-director IRA, yes. The interest rates last I heard on that are like eight and a half. We don't do those. Because then we have to set up, you set up completely different. We have to have something going on with the, with the SEC, and we have a whole other thing we got to deal with in that world. You know, so when you start talking about that, we would be violating some laws, doing what we're doing here, and then we do one of those, we'll be violating those laws over there. So the best thing to do is just don't take on the other half of the business. Question: you, You're talking about real estate investors getting loans. Do you do private individuals? Private individuals, as far as just the person, yeah. that's what we do it too. Okay. Like we don't lend to LLCs um, because then you start getting into that whole recourse issue and all that kind of thing. We lend directly to the individual. I've had many of my, this is the part where the disclaimer comes in, um, I've had many of the people I work with, after they've closed on it and they've paid a couple of payments on it, you know, they got 60 days worth of, uh, worth of payments, then they flipped over into their LLC. So it was a, um, Help me out. What's that? The type of LLC, my mind's going blank. Single member LLC. Sole proprietorship. It was a single member LLC. <coughs> yeah, so yeah, sole proprietorship basically. Mm -hmm. So it was their, their own personal, they didn't have anybody else on it. In that situation, you have what's called continuity of obligation. 
Uh, Fannie Mae has some written the rules. They call that's the words they use: continuity of obligation. You have to verify that there that there is some continuity there from where the position of the property is now to the position of the property when they're doing the loan on it. So if a person comes to me with a home within an LLC saying I want to rebuy it. It's currently my LLC, and they transfer the title over to them so I can do the loan. I can show that that was their LLC. They were the sole member on it. There's a continuity of that obligation. I can tie it to them. But if they're saying I'm going to do a refinance on it and that belonged to somebody else, there's no continuity of obligation because it's not theirs. You can't refi what you don't own. That's kind of what it really boils down to. They can still tie it to you. But you can make a loan to someone who's not a real estate investor. Correct. No, I do it all day long. Okay. Yeah. Here's one. That, here's another really cool thing. Um, if you're getting into the real estate investment world and you go to a local bank and they're going to say, well, you want to buy that property and it's six hundred dollars a month and you're right now you're making let's say forty five hundred and your debts are coming into almost three thousand, so your debt to income ratio is too high. We can't add six hundred dollars more debt to you. So you can't qualify, right? That sound, that sound normal? Have you heard that before? <coughs> One of the cool things that I have the ability to do within this organization, and it happens on every transaction, is if you're coming to me with a house that's renting for a thousand a month, and the payment's six hundred, I can take that thousand, discount it by twenty-five percent because I have to consider maybe some vacancy. So I take seven fifty, I back to six hundred out of that seven fifty, I give you one hundred fifty dollars to your income and add no expense. You now qualify because you didn't get any expense, you just got income. Does that make sense? We can use the rents as income before you even own it. Even if it's not rented yet, it could be being marketed at that point. I have the appraiser do an appraisal on the property. He tells me what it'll rent for. He gives me a rent about rent schedule. He also gives me a <coughs> operating income statement on it. And I take those numbers and I use that. Now that comes with a, that comes with a price. Because when you get to the final closing, or you get the initial loan disclosures and it shows how much your appraisal is, you're going to call me up and so say, you've got to be freaking kidding me. Appraisals are 300 bucks, Chapman. What is this $700 fee? Because they're going to charge 400 and some dollars for an appraisal. They're going to charge another 150 bucks for the operating income statement, another $150 for the rent ratio fit to the uh, rent uh, survey. They charge for that. It's not cheap. But what do you get out of it? Huge leverage. So there's a, there's a definite silver line to every expense. You get what you pay for in that particular world. Now, there's a lot of banks out there that say, well, we're gonna still we're gonna still demand that, but we can't use it because we don't have a history of you being a real estate investor. We don't have a background on this. How can we say that you're gonna be successful at that because you don't have two, two years on your taxes, right? That's very common. But that's, again, why I hung my license with this firm. They get that. They understand that. I've been using it all along. I had one client, for instance, uh, on paper, he made sixteen hundred. I think it was twelve or thirteen hundred dollars a month because he was sole proprietorship. He wrote everything off, but his his expenses came to about eight hundred. Would he qualify in that world? Between his car and his rent, which is rent with real lien, because he was living with roommates, and they all split up the cost on on the lease itself. So I was able to prove that eight hundred dollars a month. And he was showing thirteen hundred dollars a month in 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 his income. There's no way he qualified, but he had like sixty thousand dollars. He bought four houses. That cash flowed over 300 a piece. We added that 300 almost four to his income. He now qualified for all four, as long as he closed all four on the same day. Yes. Um, during those loans, uh, what are your qualifications? Do you get by their FICO score or? I don't know. Well, FICO score is one of them. Okay. So there's there's multiple qualifications. We'll get into the FICO score is going to be a minimum of 680, 680 or higher. Now, your credit score does have a, an adjustment that it does to your interest rate. So you're going to look at it, you're going to say the base rate that day for a $50,000 loan was 5%. Um, but your credit score is 730s. They set the benchmark at 740, and then anything from 720 to 739, they bump up your interest rate about an eighth of a percent. Because, again, it's a pension fund. This is somebody's pension money. This is somebody's retirement account. They are taking on additional risk because you have a little bit lower score. They have to set the, set the bar somewhere, right? So they're taking on all this additional risk, so they want additional <coughs> income for their risk. The same way you would want a little bit of additional income for any risk that you're going to take on. Then if it drops below 729 to 720, uh, excuse me, 719 to 700, you're going to experience probably another 8 of a percent increase from 699 to 680. 
you'll experience even more. It starts to jump even more. You'll probably get about a quarter percent bump in at that point. But you're still in the game, right? So at that point, you went from five to five and a half, and you're buying, let's say, a sixty-five, seventy thousand dollar house. You got a fifty some odd thousand dollar loan. You bumped up a half a percent. How much do you really think that affects your 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 payment and your cash flow? Any guesses? Yeah, five or ten bucks, maybe twelve or thirteen. Nothing, right? If we're talking about playing in a world where you're making two to three hundred dollars a month cash flow. Are you going to really get that bent up for about fourteen bucks? There's no reason to get in the game. So credit score, we hit that one. But debt to income ratio is another one. Most banks are going to tell you it's forty-three or forty-five percent, right? They're going to take your gross income. They're going to figure out 40 to 40, 43 to 45 percent of that is, and if your debts exceed that, you do not qualify. And if you have not had real estate for at least two years, and that's be multiple forms of real estate that's appeared on your taxes, you will not be able to use that income to qualify. Now, let's flip to the firm that I'm with. 50 percent debt to income ratio for the real estate investment. The person buying a house to live in is still 43. If you're buying a house to get income off of, we bumped up to 50. And on top of that, we get to count the rents. So you could already be at a 70% ratio, but because you're buying two houses, they're going to cash flow it up, I need you down below it to 49, you do not qualify for those two houses. Because we have a little bit more of an optimistic thought about what you're doing. Then the next thing, I would say, we got the income, we got the credit. <clears throat> then the only real other major thing that's going to prevent you from, from buying real estate is the assets. You have to have the cash to put into the property. You have to have the 20%. We have to show that going into it or enough capital to pay cash and pull the J maneuver and just keep recycling the same 25,000 bucks, right? So you have to have something to get started. The only other aspect in that that we have to have is reserves. They have to have you show that there's enough money sitting somewhere to be able to pay payments if things did not, you know, if they, if they went unrented. Now, they're not gonna look at, hey, you've got all this extra cash flow over here, so yeah, you, we know you're gonna have enough money from your cash flows here to pay that one. They have to look at it in a catastrophic thought process because they're bankers. The cup is half empty, right? So since the cup is half empty in their world, they need to show that you have a certain percentage of the balances left over. And we will run that calculation for you personally at the time we do your transaction because it's a really weird formula. You know, it's so many months reserves for the property that you're working on and a percentage of the outstanding balance of any other properties that you own in an incremental amount. So 2% for the first four, 4% for the first six, and 6% for the 10, for, for 7 to 10. So we have to rerun that calculator depending upon how many properties you have. And that's really your only accelerator pedal. Once I've qualified you on income and your, and your credit stays pretty close to the same, at that point it's all about the funds you have available to back you up in the form of reserves. And we can use 401ks and we can use IRAs. The only thing we really can't use out there, I think we can even use cash value on um, life insurance policies. The one I think that I have the hardest time, if I remember, I think it's the only one is four or three weeks. Four or three weeks, you have to either be out of your job or, or a certain age to be able to touch them. That, that one right there is unusable. And you have it. Do you do um, cash out refis on manufactured homes? That one is where I'm stuck. But I do have an institution that will. So what, about multi, what about multifamily? Multifamily, do up to four, finance, uh, four units all day long. One to four, and if you're going beyond that, yeah. If you got, um, well, as far as it multifamily, as in the structure itself has multiple in it. The parcel itself does. The parcel has how many? You've got multi multi buildings. Multi buildings in the parcel. In the parcel. That would fall more of an under commercial world, depending upon what kind of buildings they are. So they're, they're residential. They're all residential. We'd have to talk a little bit on offline about that. How many structures are in it? It's got four buildings, seven units total. So I would definitely fall under more of an apartment style type thing, so I'd definitely fall under your commercial. Um, we'd have to just kind of take a look at what the value is there. I've got a person out in Texas that specializes in that and whether or not she'd be able to make that work. Yes, sir. What is your average rate? Average rate right now is it's been, I'm gonna go a little bit of history here. Pre-election, everything is about 4.6, 4.7 for an 80% loan to value. And then everybody anticipated the election of Donald Trump was going to do what to the stock market? The stock market was going to crash, right? And it was crashing as he was making as he was making headway in the polls, right? We're watching it crash 900 points. It opens up the next day. What happened? 
<laughs> highest it's ever been. So we anticipated the interest rates to completely fall to the floor if Trump got elected. So a lot of the Trump people are like, yeah, let's, let's hold off. All these, all these, these Trump guys that were in my, that were in my database are like, hold off. Let's just hold after the election because I know it's going to win and they're going to get these awesome rates. Rates went to hell. And they went from 4.625 on the average. They immediately screamed up to about five and three eighths. Then Janet Yellen came out and started flapping her mouth. We went to five and three quarters at that point. Now it's backed off of that and made its way back down to five and an eighth. But in the last two days, we're back to five and in a quarter, possibly five and three, depending upon the loan amount and the credit score. But actually today, price went to five and three. I price went to five and a half today for a guy at 44,000 with a 715 credit score. Because of what's going on right now, this back and forth. The jobs reports coming out, every ADP, uh, I think they forecasted 280,000 jobs, if I remember correctly. Um, they're anticipating 200,000, so that means why this is affecting rates is because their belief is the economy is getting stronger. So if the economy is getting stronger, where are you going to put your money? You put it in the stocks, right? Because you're going to make a bigger dividend, you're going to make it here if your stock price is going to go up, you're going to make more money on your stocks, right? Because equities are growing up because the economy is doing better, businesses are doing better. Well, if it's doing not so good, where are you going to put it? You're going to shove it into a bond as quickly as you can because you're going to set your price. And then as everything else is falling, you're set at that one particular rate of return because you grabbed it that day. That's why interest rates drop because it's a bond. It's a long-term bond. The person that buys into that, pension fund or whatever, when we use that money, the second we lock in your interest rate, they're getting paid at whatever that rate is. And if the market goes down and the rates keep dropping, they're making more money than they would have otherwise. And that's kind of how it's playing. There's a certain amount of money out in the market and it just shifts from, from uh, instrument to instrument depending on what's going on in the news. Our stock's really worth 20800 or whatever it is. Have you met anybody? Have you guys sat with anybody at Starbucks or had anybody talking in the line at Chick-fil-A that the stocks are doing awesome and they want to go get into it? I haven't. I have no idea where these people are at, but this thing's <coughs> jump at. This is day traders and big firms that keep moving it says, because this firm's moving it, so we're going to move it. So it's a bunch of people kicking the same soccer ball down the field. And there's nobody on the opposite side of the field saying, you should probably stop playing soccer. <laughs> So now that's what we're dealing with here. Everybody loves stocks. They want to see it take off. Yes, sir. How do we make our money? We make our money, one, by servicing it, by servicing the loan. And then we are, we, when it comes to fees out there, the, the banker fees, there's there's really a range that I see out there. It starts at about 900 bucks. I've seen this stock at about 2,500. We're right in the middle at 16. And the reason we're at that level is because I've had auditors take a look at everything. They're looking at our books. They're looking at how we're having to pay. The manufacturing costs are ridiculous now. Back in the country, it was 495 bucks all day long. Everybody complained about that. Because we only had to have myself, a person to set up the loan, send out the disclosures, and a processor to close the loan in an underwriter. You'd have four people in the mix. That was it. Oh, I had to have a closer for a sender to send the wire. I had to have five people. Some of me didn't have to pay that much money. Now we have all these compliance people. I have to have one person on staff just to click the appraisal <coughs> button to order it. Literally. The government says I have to have that person in here and I have to pay them a $15 an hour wage to click order appraisal. I can't do it. None of my other staff can do it because they're based on they're based on production. Since I'm sold solely commission, I don't get anything of that fee. Um, and since the other staff is they get receive a bonus on performance. The person who orders appraisal cannot receive a bonus on performance because then they would be influenced on the performance to get that appraisal done. So I'm like, how are they going to influence an appraisal by clicking order? How am I influencing an appraisal by clicking order? In fact, appraisers right now, the government in a way has kind of made them their, hey, how do you put this? So like a protected class. I can't talk to them. You can't talk to them. Nobody can talk to them. You can't understand their logic. And it's, I think it's going to a point the government's going to classify them as their own gender. Because <laughs> it's that ridiculous in how we interact with these guys. You have to be very cautious about what you say. I, I've had friends that were appraisers, they're still appraisers. It can actually be looked at very, very poorly if I go to dinner and hang out with a friend who's an appraiser. 
Yes, sir. Can you give a dollar for every man hundred thousand dollar loss? What what your bottom line will be? So when I said uh, budget for five thousand dollars, that's very real. And when I'm saying the five thousand, not just us, you're talking about the top company. Top company is expensive enough for the room. <laughs> What it would cost you to borrow the money is really the five thousand dollars minus the taxes and the insurance um, and any other and prepaid interest. So you're probably looking at somewhere right around the thirty-eight hundred dollar range is what I'm guessing, just off the top of my head, for a hundred thousand dollar transaction. You know, appraisals are running close to nine hundred bucks. We're at sixteen. You're going to look at another fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars, depending upon which state for the uh, for the uh, title. I just closed the transaction in Pennsylvania with a charge of the person four thousand dollars for title. <coughs> And it's a sixteen thousand dollar transaction. You know, some states are ridiculous. But Pennsylvania also has a. Uh, and I'm, I'm just warning you guys, stay out of Pennsylvania. They've got a a two and a half or three percent transfer tax. So if it transfers from one person to the next, they're going to charge you two and a half percent from the state. Mm -hmm. This guy was just moving it from his LLC to his personal name. They charged him two and a half percent. He transferred it. <coughs> so, Exactly. Yeah. At least we get the finance out over over thirty years. Yes, ma'am. Do you work for just one pension fund, or do you broker out to various? We can broker it out to various funds. We actually are a direct lender. It's our money, but we lend it, and then we get reimbursed by the pension. Is how we do that. Um, so that way we can securitize it, and we're not having to just deploy our money everywhere because you you only have so much, right? And when you're um, we have to be cautious, so we have to be selective which pension we deal with. So we, let's, let's talk about some of the bigger banks, right? Bank of America and Wells Fargo's and Chase's. They go to pension funds. They get their same money from the same place, but they go to different ones. The ones that say, hey, we'll give you the best interest rate available, which will probably be about three eighths to, a, to a, you know, possibly even a half percent lower in some cases, depending upon the type of instrument, but they're gonna restrict it. They say, we don't want risk. We want a person that qualifies for every dollar, right? We, if it's a real estate investor, they can only do two loans or three loans, something like that, and we don't want any more loans. If they already have three or four investment properties, we don't do a loan for them, period. Because they don't want the risk. They figure if you have more than, more than four properties, they figure you're a very risky person. So they're gonna restrict it a lot more to give you that lower price because their risk is lower. We go to a place that gives us a lot more freedom on the risk. So you say I can go to 50% debt to income ratio. They'll, they'll let me use the, the rents to qualify and you've never owned rent, a rental before. They'll let me do all these things. They'll let me do all 10 finance properties in one place. They'll let me do it for 20% down because they're getting a little bit more for it. Plus, they've audited everything that we do. They understand why we're doing it. They know this is not a transactional relationship. They see that I'm doing this one, two, three, four, ten 10 times for a person, then strategizing the payoff for one, then doing another. And then they say, wait a minute. He's working on trying to get these things paid off, get us paid back in under 10 years, so yeah, we want to put more money with this company, but they also want to get compensated for the risk. Because they know they can go somewhere else and get that same return on that risk, and sometimes even more. So that's that's why we have to stick with the fund that we stick with. There's only about one or two funds that let us do that, as I understand it. I'm not the secondary guy, I'm just kind of going off of what he told me. Let's see your hand, yes sir. Well, another lender, they use something called a debt service coverage ratio. That falls under a lot more of a more commercial thought process, mm -hmm. um, but we still look at that, but it's unnecessary to look at it in that particular role, especially when I have the capability to do what I do. You know, so I'm looking at having the ability to use those rents already offset the, the offset your, your income, mm -hmm. and add your income, a debt service coverage ratio doesn't really need to apply. Is there a specific reason why you asked that? I got an email from the company today. Uh, Processing it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Makes sense. They're, they're thinking more along the lines of a commercial thought process. Which makes sense. In some world, that's when that's when you're not looking what the person makes to play into the thing. You're looking at what the property is going to do to pay for itself, in essence. They're underwriting the asset. And, we, and a lot of times we do something very similar called a collateral and like to underwrite the property itself to make sure it fits certain criteria. Um, and as long as it fits that criteria, we're also underwrite you as an individual to make sure that you're that we're not putting you in a position, right? When we look back on the 2000s, what were people saying? 
I didn't know what I was getting into. No, they were setting me up. I was being put into this something that I didn't understand. Well, now we're, we are held very liable for that. There's something called um, ability to repay that I have to adhere to. That's why I have to get your income up front. When you're going through, a, through, the, through the qualifying process, I ask for your tax returns. I ask for your bank statements. I ask for your pay stubs. So I have to be able to say, yes, I looked at the income and they can support this. Because if you couldn't, then I'd be, that's me being a predator, and I'm gonna have black SUVs in my parking lot. I don't make commercial loans. I do have an associate down in Texas. I sit for all my commercial deals. She does a phenomenal job. What I figured is, I used to do commercial, I used to do construction, I used to do HELOCs, I used to do um, your residential stuff, and I used to do investment stuff, I used to do it all. And then I found you can only be sexy at one or two things. And since I'm not the sexiest out there, I gotta focus on the one. And I understand residential investment stuff very well. I understand that the conventional lenders out there are very good at screwing it up, therefore I have a business. Any other questions? Again, thank you very much. Thank you.